50. Uh, it's going to be a working group focused on documentation. So if that's your cup of tea, you'll want to be out the back door and just out that way. And we'll start in about uh, two minutes or so. So get where you want to be. Well, you can lose my power. I don't lose it while I'm this charger. Oh, this charger. Oh, okay. And now I have to get that special thing again. Yeah. Oh, we got to work. Yes. This way. This side. This way. I bet. The poor guy's on top. Up here. Oh. Ready for a match table? Yep. Oh, no, 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 no. Or Zapper, rather. Jake. What was it like? He was just a Zapper. The Zapper. Yep. Didn't want Jake. Well, I don't think it did. Well, he's crying. Crying. Because we don't want to. Your, yeah, because it was your Zapper. We. We're not sure if it was that or me constantly re-plugging the uh, power bar. So I yeah, so it doesn't list anything connected now with the adapter, and that's what I... Okay, so we'll try to use the other cable now. Yeah. You guys are quite warm. Yeah, they can warm. It's pretty cozy in there. <laughs> yep. There's HDMI. Ooh, what? First? Yeah. I'm just famous. <laughs> Uh, still not, not listing now for some reason. Oh. I can try rebooting again for a second. Uh, no, 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 no. If you don't try to set mirrored, set it to extend. No, I just do XR and R. It doesn't oh, say, it, it says all. HDMI and DisplayPort aren't connected. Oh, shit, yeah. So it's only when I plug in directly? Let me see if I just plug in directly or... Or we can just use, uh, oh, no, I need no, this one. Wrong one. <laughs> this one, and then straight it out to... Yep. Just, just the test. Just the test. Oh, no. It's not. It's, so it's not that. It's still not. So I'm going to have to... Try rebooting with all the cabling connected. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to pull the cabling first, and then... Um, yeah, right here, try booting it back up. I don't have this problem with knives. You do? I don't. You're running OpenBSD? No, FreeBSD. And you have like the i9 and 5 drivers and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. I see. There we go. You seen something? No, I just got it to boot. <laughs> I have a jelly encrypted disk, so it's yeah, a long passphrase. So with all the pressure, you know, just typing that in with the challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, now right here. Okay. And then did we get a capture on this guy? Yeah. Now this will be the thing. Once I log in here. Yeah, that'll be the challenge. I think you know, I think it might have been on all the time. It just was not. Let's see. So now it's connected. X R and R minus minus out split. There we go. Not exactly. The, uh, the you don't get it. What's that? <laughs> I, I just did an XRNR. So what happens is it would automatically show up in, in show XDM. I'd log in, it would show nothing. But then I just put an XRNR minus minus output HDMI minus minus same as LVDS1. Is oh. your, um, is you, do you have the 1080p display? Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything should just work. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Can't find it's not. 
I thought doing the thing where it feeds the second. No, I wouldn't touch it. I don't want to say that. I didn't just say that. No. And you can try to play with mine. Do you want to do custom and then? Where should I go to the Slack channel? Or? Explain what the session is and then we'll uh... all right welcome back uh, everyone hopefully um, you've had some good food to eat and um, the the session now is um, a working session on the FreeBSD Foundation's uh, roadmap so we presented an initial take on a roadmap I think about um, two-ish years ago um, and have worked on a number of tasks that are, are listed on there. But the, the goal from, from, uh, from here and from this session is to collect feedback from folks in the audience um, around the Foundation's uh, focus and priorities um, on our funded development efforts. So I'm going to have um, uh, Joe go over briefly some of the projects that, um, that we're funding that are kind of individual point projects or project grants. Um, some, some fit more or less into the, the overall theme of, of the roadmap, but one of the foundation's um, sort of ongoing tasks is to fund interesting work that's proposed within the community. So we'll talk about those um, a little bit, uh, but let me just uh, start off um, here. So this is what we presented um, a couple of years ago as the, the foundation's um, initial uh, uh, roadmap, and I'm just going to talk about uh, very briefly the things that have been um, completed or um, uh, mostly uh, mostly uh, complete. So some of these, um, you know, we've we've done a prototype or we've investigated something, and it is now uh, in the committed to the tree, or it's in in a code review, or so someone else has kind of taken on next steps for it. Um, and so the first one on this list is is sort of the the long, uh, long running project to improve Wi-Fi support in FreeBSD. Um, we've been uh, we've been funding Bjorn to do work on uh, Intel Wi-Fi drivers and other Wi-Fi drivers, um, and that work uh, that work is in the tree. Um, uh, contemporary Intel drivers, uh, except for some of the most recent ones. Um, are available and using uh, via the Linux KPI. Um, we we haven't made as much progress as we'd like on improving uh, the speed, uh, basically support for for newer um, uh, newer Wi-Fi standards, um, and so that's uh, still on the to-do list. Um, Bjorn's had a few um, issues that occupied his his time and hasn't been, he hasn't been able to spend as much time as he is hoping to on this um, to date, but um, we're hoping that that will improve in the future. Um, let's see, uh, I had a, um, 
uh, a co-op student a couple of um, uh, terms ago look at uh, reviving an old prototype of a, a renewed idea for the FreeBSD installer. Um, and so this was decoupling the uh, the actual backend logic from the, the presentation um, and, and using a, a web interface to drive um, the installer. This is a prototype that, um, that he's published a, a little document on and is available um, for um, for, for further research and experimentation. Um, and I think one of the, the goals that um, we'd like to talk about in this, uh, this session is, is next steps for some of the um, usability and, and uh, installer improvements. Um, we had on our roadmap bringing ARM64 to tier one status in FreeBSD. Um, and that, that project is, uh, is complete. Um, uh, as of FreeBSD 13, uh, ARM64 is our, uh, is our second, um, is our, our uh, a third, um, in lineage. In yeah, it, 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 it is, uh, it is one of two current, our, uh, tier one architectures. Um, it is the, the, um, uh, the third one to become, uh, tier one, but, um, uh, we, we said, we said, we, we said they were tier one, but they weren't really. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was looking through the, the history of those and I'm like, wait a second, what is this, this commit here that says core is approved spark 64 is tier one. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so Andy, um, uh, Andy did a bunch of work, uh, and others in the community did a bunch of work, um, to get there. Uh, and at this point there's still, um, there's still ongoing work to be done on ARM64. Um, but it, it sort of falls under the, um, just the umbrella of work to support tier one CPU architectures. It's, it's not a specific individual project for ARM64 support anymore. Um, and Beehive, um, the, the ARM support, we funded Andy to do some of the um, improvements and, and getting those patches um, uh, moved along. That's been a, a project that's had many different owners um, over time uh, and many different, uh, different folks have been involved. Um, Andy is now at ARM and is continuing to, to push that along, but that work is in, uh, in review in Fabricator and um, it, it sort of you know, our, the foundations portion of, of moving that along is, um, uh, is complete, but, uh, um, Andy is carrying on with that and, and, uh, I foresee it landing in the tree in the not too distant future. Um, we had some, uh, beehive, um, uh, some issues with beehive security vulnerabilities, um, that were reported and, um, uh, we've had, uh, John on an occasional long-term contract to, to be able to deal with things like that when they crop up. And that has been, um, been quite valuable for us to address, um, a couple of things that, um, that have come up. Um, we've also invested quite a bit in LLDB. Um, we've, we've put a bunch of work into bringing it towards parity with, with GCC or GDB. Um, there's still work to do, uh, certainly on the LLDB front. Um, but, uh, through our investments, um, it is now, uh, uh, able to debug FreeBSD kernel, uh, core dumps or, or live kernel debugging. Um, there's just some work to do that's going to continue on in a GSOC, uh, um, GSOC project, but, um, it's, uh, it's moving along. Um, and then the, the foundation has also, uh, invested quite a bit into, adding security vulnerability mitigations um, through work that Caustic and others uh, have done and provided um, ongoing operational support um, to the uh, security team. Um, Joe, do you want to uh, take over the, um, the product grants that we have on? Yeah, sure. Point? Save it. Um, yeah. Got this. <laughs> Okay, um, so I'll try not to repeat too much. It's going to be hard not to repeat too much from yesterday, uh, but we have a little bit more time, so feel free to jump in. 
Um, I know some of the people responsible for the work that I'm going to talk about are here. So uh, I'd be especially happy if you wanted to jump in, uh, elaborate, correct me or anything like that. Uh, Is there any questions on that? No, just not doing well the back of the room. Oh, okay. Oh, you're not on. Oh, there you uh, go. That wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't turn it off. Okay, here we go. Is that better? Okay, great. Um, so our latest contract is with uh, Robert Klausecker, and it relates to SIMD, so uh, modern architectures support uh, these uh, single operation or single instruction, multiple data operations. And so these apparently are um, useful for a variety of applications. Uh, uh, specifically numerical applications like graphics, uh, video coding, scientific computing, um, and other uh, C libraries support these uh, SIMD enhanced uh, C library functions. Uh, I think Android, glibc, Musil all have uh, the SIMD variants, but we don't. And so this is uh, what Robert uh, is planning to do. So. Um, for a specific list of, of functions in our C libraries, he'll create uh, SIMD enhanced uh, versions. Um, <clears throat> and Robert says that other than the applications we, we mentioned before, anything that links against our C library um, should expect uh, some performance benefits. So we're hoping, or the expectation is that we'll get some uh, broad, broad benefits in terms of performance. Um, Jake. Uh, is a former GSOC student, as I mentioned yesterday. Um, last summer, he worked to port IGB GPU tools to FreeBSD, and I think you had to tinker with the Linux KPI for that work. Um, this summer, you're going to work with Mark on some Capsicum-related problems. Um, so I'm told that uh, for programs that are designed with Capsicum in mind, it's pretty straightforward uh, to work with it, but if you have pre-existing applications, it can be challenging to port them over to Capsicum. So uh, the first stage of Jake's work is to um, develop a, a tool to identify these Capsicum violations. And then the second half of Jake's work is gonna be to Capsicumize uh, different daemons. So I have a partial list here, like syslogd, NFS daemons, Gate clients and, and uh, daemons, TFTP, NTB, NTPD, libarchive, any other ones that are important that I'm missing? Okay, so that's uh, that's going to be Jake and Mark's uh, internship in a nutshell. Uh, Ed mentioned uh, the summer intern that's going to work on uh, container type uh, problems, so that that fits into our our. Um, uh, container slash VM entry into our, our roadmap. Um, so Nauman just started their work uh, a few days ago, but I just listed one of the the first uh, tasks they completed. So it was uh, just a pull request to fix a FreeBSD specific issue in uh, this uh, containers a container monitoring uh, uh, project up on GitHub. And they're also planning to update their CI jobs so that we can detect these free FreeBSD specific problems uh, automatically and earlier. Um, anything else that I should add for that one? I don't know too much about it. Um, another summer or another intern that's working with Mark is Christos. And, and Mark, you already mentioned a bit about this earlier that um, Christos was a GSOC student for two years, if I recall correctly. He first worked with Hans Petter Seleski to update or to overhaul our mixer. Um, and then the next summer, he and Mark together um, created this uh, new DChase probe called Kinst that allows for instruction level tracing. And Kinst is, it's, is am I correct? It's available in 14.0? Yeah, for, for AMD 64 bits. So he's, this, in this past project, he also did support the Vista Risk 5 and Right, yep. Um, and, and one of the other main goals was, I think you mentioned this earlier too, he's going to implement uh, inline function tracing for this summer. Well, he's, 
I see, okay. Okay. And um, what about this uh, tail call optimized stuff? Is, is that you, it, it's listed as time permitting. Um, yeah. Uh, I, we, we don't really have to. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. You covered yourself in the in the or Christos covered himself in the contract by putting time permit, time permitting. Anything else that I missed other than those points? The the porting to RISC five ARM sixty four inline function call tracing. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So yeah, the the tail call thing is is probably not going to happen just for for folks on the stream. But uh, yeah, the the ARM sixty four ports in progress right now and. Uh, Risk five is is working and functional as far as we know. So he's also been working on like test suites and so on. Um, so once uh, once he's done, he'll he'll start uh, committing some of this stuff. Cool. So maybe there's an opportunity for a for another project at some point. Uh, Nway has been working. So Nway also another uh, GSOC student, as I mentioned a couple times already. Uh, Nway was working with WTAP, the WLAN uh, uh, simulator. So if I recall correctly, he added, uh, what was it, station, ad hoc, and host AP to, to WTAP. And um, this contract's basically ex an extension of that work. So more WTAP enhancements, so adding more physical layers, so more net 802.11 code can be tested. Adding WPA 1, 2, and 3 support to WTAP. Um, he also is uh, working on adding uh, WPA2 pre-authentication to host AP, and that should um, should allow uh, faster uh, wireless roaming, as I understand it. And then he's also going to work on some wireless driver development. So uh, there's an Athros driver that I'm forgetting uh, who started it, but it wasn't completed, so he's going to work on that. And there's two real check drivers that he's going to take a look at. And Enway is not in the room, but if he was, I would ask. He, actually, he's giving a talk here, so if you want to learn more about that work, as I mentioned yesterday, he'll, he'll be here to say more. Um, Moin has been working um, on CI stuff. So Lee Wen created, as everybody probably knows here already, some Jenkins-based uh, free, uh, FreeBSD CI infrastructure. So it tests, it runs tests automatically on pushes to source. Um, and so people have been asking about uh, further uh, ways of testing. So for example, at the pre-push stage, if you, pre if you push something to a private branch, you can get some, some tests, those tests run. Um, and that's, that's what Moin's working on. Some other uh, noteworthy de deliverables for this uh, project are to integrate uh, that work into the the build infrastructure, um, and importantly, Moin plans to add documentation to the committer's guide, uh, so people, developers, know how to use all this. Uh, Lee Wen, is there anything that I should add there about uh, Moin uh, extension of your work? Is that the gist of it? Okay, so Lee Wen just said for the stream he's going to talk more in the working group, which, is that right? Yeah. So, which I assume that will be on the stream as well. Uh, so Mina has been working on uh, cloud in it. So uh, throughout this process, I've heard varying opinions of cloud in it. Uh, for better or worse, it's the standard way of provisioning servers in the cloud. So if we want these, these cloud providers to support FreeBSD, we have to have good support for cloud in it. So that's what Mina's working on. So before this work, um, so Mina is partway through the project, but before this work, Cloudinit was basically only well supported on Linux. And so she has uh, a variety of milestones. Uh, she has completed the if con config parser. There might be a few more tasks there after the fact, like realize after the fact there's a bit more work to do. Uh, complete networking class extraction, implement IBV6 configuration, uh, implement login.conf parser, rules for Azure, and again, uh, very importantly, documentation. She she calls it um, productionizing FreeBSD, and she's going to add documentation for that in the handbook. Um, probably in that same 
category in the roadmap of cloud and, and VM or containers and VM. Uh, we have a project on OpenStack. So OpenStack is a system for sharing um, resources uh, like VMs and Jiaxin is uh, uh, working to allow OpenStack to run on FreeBSD as the host. Um, and part of that work is, is modifying uh, OpenStack components. So like I think Nova, Jiaxin uh, has modified Nova to use libvirt and yeah. Beehive. Um, and uh, I believe Chijin is getting closer to the point that he can demonstrate and, and verify this work by creating a couple OpenStack clusters. So he's going to create one for the Cherry team at the University of Cambridge. So they have to share these uh, uh, Cherry Morello systems, and, and an OpenStack cluster could help with uh, managing those resources. And then there's two planned for the FreeBSD cluster, one for uh, resource management system in the NetPerf cluster, and the other one is for developers. So uh, you can spawn reference machines on different architectures, uh, VMs of, of, of different branches, different architectures that can help with testing and development. And so the goal here is just to make it uh, more self-service, so um, easier for you guys to, to do your work. Um, Kirk is working on a... Uh, uh, UFS snapshot project. So, <clears throat> as I understand it, um, UFS with soft updates supports taking snapshots because the ability to take snapshots was added after soft updates was implemented. Uh, but if you're running journaled soft updates, uh, the ability to take snapshots is not there. Um, <clears throat> and so, why are snapshots important? Um, you get reliable dumps of live file systems, number one. And number two, you can do uh, file system checks in the background. And both of those things um, avoid downtime. And so Kirk has two milestones for the project. The first is to enable snapshots for file systems running uh, journal soft updates and verify that they can be used to uh, create uh, uh, live file system dumps. And that milestone was completed in time. And the, the second one is to extend the file system checks so that the background uh, checks can be run, and that one's expected uh, in Q3 of this year, is that right? Mm -hmm. Anything that I got wrong or missed that you want to? No. Okay, great. And then we have kind of the, um, as, as Ed mentioned and I mentioned yesterday, the, the kind of long-term part-time contracts. So um, John has been working on, it's basically any type of mutually agreed upon task, but it has been like security and beehive security stuff. And I, I just listed one of the uh, bug reports that John closed not too long ago. Um, it was an issue, a buffer overread in, uh, in Beehive, and it was submitted by uh, an interesting person, Robert Morris, a professor at uh, MIT, who's known for, <laughs> go ahead, go one ahead. Of my, one of my other ones is Robert, we, there's a, a list of all the Robert Morris bugs I'm probably gonna try to work through at some point. Yeah. He, he has some very interesting system that finds memory uh, safety issues. They're all very cute. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about? No, it's just that these bug reports are very cute. I'll say yeah. that. I will just add that uh, Robert Morris also loves to go after the file system, and so uh, he found a whole bunch of ways that you could corrupt a super block to blow up the machine, and so there's now a set of checks for the super block. Uh, when I first put them in, there were eight checks, and the last time I counted, it was uh, approaching 40 checks. Cool. Uh, and uh, it, it turns out that one of the things he found was that if you make a file system on a 386 or a 32-bit architecture, uh, and then you move that disk over to a 64-bit architecture, the, the macro that figures out what the size of the cylinder group ought to be comes out four bytes larger and so if you have a cylinder group that exactly fits, then suddenly your super block fails. Uh, and it turns out that it's the macro that's the problem and not that, in fact, the, the, the uh, cylinder group is too big. Uh, but I just, like last week, committed a fix to clean that up, so. Cool. And then we've mentioned before that, um, somebody else have something? I was just wondering if that's any relation so uh, years ago, a Robert Morris um, 
perpetrated uh, security incident on the internet in the uh, the eighties. Uh, any relation, or is that it's the same person? Oh, awesome! <laughs> still finding things. <laughs> we still. Yeah, it's been useful for forty years then. <laughs> Yeah, while we're loving on him, he also found a really cute bug in the iSCSI target when I have to be working on it with a remote panic. So, very interesting bugs. Okay, so uh, we've mentioned this again. Mitchell puts in a couple hours a month, I think, on average. On on again, it's it's any type of mutually agreed upon work. I think with the foundation, it tends to be mostly uh, Risk Five. Uh, we've already talked about Bjorn. Bjorn. Also, so maybe I'll just say that um, from our perspective, I think Bjorn's work has largely been successful in that you can take almost, you know, modern wireless, Intel wireless anyway works on FreeBSD. We don't have the speeds that we like to see, but um, Bjorn is likely going to have more time and there might be some other uh, endeavors in the future, but uh, it's, it's, it's on our radar still that... Um, we know people want to get those fast wireless speeds. And then, Mark, I really, <laughs> I, I don't want to, it's hard for me to talk about. Again, Mark, we do like any mutually agreed upon work that Mark wants to do. We've had kind of a long standing, long standing relationship with Mark, so uh, we're happy uh, whenever we can work with him. And I, I think that's about all I have to say about the contracts. Is there anything that you want to add? Or? Yeah, I only wanted to add on this slide is that, um, that really, the goal with, with these, um, uh, the focus on, on here really is to have a long-term kind of relationship so that in the event that something comes up um, where we need some expertise on a specific domain, um, we're able to kind of uh, you know have the framework in place to be able to, to quickly um, get something accomplished within that, uh, that area. So uh, you know, none of the people um, uh, listed here are, are working like full time for the foundation, or, or you know, it's uh, it's it's either it's somewhere between um, a few hours a month, or or you know, more about um, maybe quarter time or something like that, depending or half time, depending on on the individual cases. But really, the goal is to be able to to quickly step in um, if there's a, a need in a um, a very quick way. That's pretty much all I have, I think. All right. Um, we can switch back to the other, um, the other set of slides. Um, they do this. And then my next, um, my next couple of slides here are things that were listed on the, um, uh, the roadmap uh, that we presented a couple of years ago that are still open. Um, and so as I mentioned, um, Wi-Fi, we have ongoing bug fixes, uh, of course, but, um, but also um, uh, improved uh, uh, newer standards um, on the to-do li to list still. Uh, we are interested in, um, in helping out with efforts to bring about a fully um, BSD licensed Linux KPI uh, layer. So for those who aren't aware, the um, Linux KPI uh, that as used for um, uh, display drivers, for example, consists of BSD licensed components in the base system. Um, and then a few, um, a few bits that are uh, available in um, a Linux KPI port, um, which are GPL. Uh, and so our, our, it, goal is to provide all of the interfaces that are needed by the um, display drivers in the base system Linux KPI. Um, uh, and so far, that work has been um, been done outside of the foundation, um, but it's something that we're very interested in and, and are willing to invest if, uh, if necessary. Um, package base is another case um, where, you know, the foundation hasn't um, invested significantly um, to date. But um, uh, it, it's a it's an area that's um, that we see as important and are are willing to um, to continue uh, or willing to invest uh, as well. Um, we had uh, Thunderbolt and USB four, um, uh, improve like uh, Thunderbolt and USB uh, four support 
um, on the roadmap with a potential developer identified who is um, no longer uh, available for that work. Um, and so this is something I think that is still going to be important uh, moving forward, but, um, but we, will, um, uh, we will need to, uh, to find a resource for it. And Joe's passing the mic to Warner. Um, I, so the, I, I'm not aware of, of recent, um, uh, about a year or a year and a half. yeah, so, so I mean that, that, yeah, that work exists, um, and, and certainly ought to be used as a starting point for whatever happens. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of anything happening. Um, I, I'm not either. yeah, I was, was wondering if, you know. yeah, there's, there's certainly no, no desire to, um, avoid using anything that exists, but, um. But I think there's there's quite a lot to do. Um, that's my shipping container on the slide here. Um, so uh, um, we've we've had um, uh, a long-standing interest in containerization, um, uh, improved containerization uh, on FreeBSD, and. Um, I think our on on the roadmap a while back we had um, an initial period of investigation and research, um, and I think we're uh, we're at the point now where um, uh, starting with with a co-op student this term, but then moving forward, um, looking at scoping uh, specific specific projects for improvements that are needed. Um, I have overlay file systems in um, uh, uh, UnionFS on the um, the list here. There's um, there's some work, uh, it, it seems, um, uh, being planned out that, um, that should move things, um, uh, ahead there in the not too distant future. So that's something that might happen, um, uh, independently. Oh, oh, the... Just ask if you can oh, on, on, on the stream, the, uh... Blue light on? Yes, blue light is on. Talking to? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Yes, go. Okay. The room was definitely quiet at all. But it works? Yeah. Does Zoom want to connect it to you being the one on the stream? No, that's it, yeah. Yeah, the, the mic that you have. Is that the great thing about Yeah, that's great. But it would be good to just maybe repeat the question, Ed. You would really be happy. Oh, because you were live. Speak in. You can hear me? Yeah, the new signal thing you use. All right, how's that? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. Um, 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 <laughs> Just give me a question for now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the the um, the roadmap, we had um, uh, installer work, and that's something that's still um, uh, still open. Uh, I think. Um, let me just see what. Um, um, I think one of the um, one of the, my goals in this session is to get feedback from um, folks who are here and, and give us um, insight into what um, what you see is important. But one of the goals I think it, for the foundation over the next um, next while is basically the high level idea of reducing friction. Um, and so anything that makes it easier for new users to get up to speed on FreeBSD quickly is something that's that that's um, we want to to kind of map into the um, the roadmap. So, um, you know, whether that's installer improvements or uh, developer workflow improvements, uh, better debugging uh, tools, performance tooling, things, um, things of that nature. So, uh, some additional um, um, items that are still on the roadmap. Um, the longstanding uh, RAID Z expansion project is unfortunately still open. Um, we're in some discussions to um, to find uh, other developers to to wrap up the the uh, final um, final review and integration 
Um, and I really hope that we can make progress on that in the, the near future. Um, we're continuing with uh, proactive security items. So things like the uh, capsicum work that um, uh, Joe mentioned falls into that, that broad umbrella. Um, making uh, performance uh, tooling um, more easily usable to, to end users is um, uh, some productizing it and improving it is something that's, uh, that's also of, of high interest. Um, and then I basically just have um, uh, some, some updated versions of the, um, the same slides that we've um, presented before. It's largely the, the items that we've just talked about, about what's, um, what's still uh, on the list. But I really would like to get um, feedback and ideas from, um, from folks here as to kind of where, um, where do you see gaps that are not being um, filled in, in, the, um, in the existing community? Where do you see investment being important? And um, we'll, we'll try moving the little mic around uh, and get, get feedback from, from the stream if... Uh, is the mic available? No, no other. Maybe, we, I guess we'll just have to repeat it. No. Okay. Yeah. We can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, all right, so I'm on, so on Discord, we got Sean Webb um, just reiterating that uh, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt support is going to be rather critical, um, you know, just for, especially with like newer devices, you know, smaller form factor connectors and such. Um, but I also wanted to bring up, you know, just general, general desktop support. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a guilty guilty one myself i am literally part of the desktop team i maintain a desktop environment i have to maintain you know the the building blocks of said desktop environment along with you know the rest of my team but but um historically desktop i think in general when it comes to just open source open source you know funding is not really has has not historically been that big of a priority for some reason so i'd like to you know like especially since you know like we're all kind of doing it you know, with very finite resources, with basically just doing it for fun, and oftentimes it not being very fun because things keep breaking all the time because it's desktop. Um, you know, probably probably something along those lines. I'm just spit, spitballing, obviously, but mm -hmm. um, but I'm also speaking as someone who has to do this stuff on my own without much support. So, yeah, I think um, it's it's a um... It's it's a interesting question I think um, about how best could um, uh, could the foundation provide resources to help with with tasks like that. Um, yeah, I mean, like provide, I mean, no, even for the even for like when you try to bring up even for when you try to bring up like you know getting your getting your folks you know users contributors whoever into the community like you know like the desktop the desktop experience is going to be just ever increasing increasingly important um in fact just earlier on discord someone was someone was literally saying that uh you know i mean this goes back to the installer but even beyond the installer you know like it was like they only gave it gave us one shot it didn't boot up and they're gone and you know like so th there there's some there's some user experience stuff in there but also just just the ability to just you know use this as a use this kind of as a daily driver, but also use this to actually help improve FreeBSD. So. On, on the desktop thing in general, um, I saw some commentary from the uh, lead of Asahi Linux a couple days ago talking about why they picked KDE and why are they doing an opinionated installer? They're basically saying, we're putting all of our effort into one thing. We're customizing the one thing. Um, you can run anything you want, but this is what's going to work, and this is the community that we've had good luck working with, and we're not going to screw around with weird niche window managers. Sure, they're great for a lot of people, but they're not great for the average user. Um, you know, 
if, if we don't pick anything, then we're bad at everything. Um, so we should pick something, and it should be KDE. <laughs> um, I think, uh, I mean, I think that's, a, that's an important, important point. Brooks, one question um, I was wondering, do you have any uh, insight or feedback from um, uh, uh, Cherry BSD desktop, uh, like, um, uh, experience? I mean, we're, we're doing, a, we have a, in our installer, we, we install a meta package that installs a fully memory safe KDE desktop environment. Um, and we're, use, we're using KDE because it's modern C++, um, built on QT framework. Um, there's a lot of advantages using KDE and QT from an API perspective. You're not, you avoid a bunch of the worst things about POSIX. Um, and they're they're wrapped up in nice nice APIs and whatnot. Um, we think we're going to be able to do some interesting things with compartmentalization and better communication. Um, and then we also install actually a second meta package, which is the few things that we don't have support for, which is basically to say Firefox and Chrome. Um, we don't have ported yet. Chrome's coming, but any week now. We have some experience dealing with Eclipse, and uh, the experience. Oh, <laughs> In the Cherry context, we also have some experience trying to deal with glib, and uh, the QT KDE code base is just a lot uh, less gnarly, say it that way. So just on this front, I'll uh, remind everyone that uh, we just hired a new user land developer, and if you look at the job description, a lot of these things are on there. I mean, it's not to say it's, it's one person, it's Pierre. Uh, <laughs> but it's on our radar. We know it's important. We agree it's important. Um, just reducing friction for New Year's is, is, is really important. We agree. Do you want to say something? Uh, so I hope you're open to some tough questions as well. Uh, so, uh, I agree with Brooks that uh, we definitely should uh, like pick and choose uh, carefully what we invest in. But I I wonder, uh, uh, like from my perspective, of course, in this limited perspective, but uh, why to invest in desktop at all? Like if we are, uh, do we have some like uh, experience how the new users comes come to the project? Because I. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect they come to through desktop, right? So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, we either have something, in my opinion, we either have something very unique, which brings new users because FreeBSD does that and no, nobody else does this, or we do something much better than uh, competition. So users come to FreeBSD because we did do this the best, right? So uh, I don't think we will ever do desktop the best. And that's uh, lost cause. Of course, uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it at all, but, uh, uh, but definitely I agree with that we should, uh, like from my perspective, I think we should find some niches, like for example, storage. We have ZFS, ZFS, uh, Linux uh, leaders have problems with, with uh, ZFS, so uh, being able to have like the best file system on the market, it's nice differentiator in my opinion, and also like maybe other stuff, right? But uh, mm, I'm not so sure about about the desktop. I was uh, I was uh, having FreeBSD desktop for for a long time, but. I, I gave up at some point, like many of you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's. I think there's going to be a few comments on this, and so I won't. I won't say anything uh, just yet. I'll pass uh, it around to a few people. Yeah. yeah so I, I guess I, I would say I I had Popple's opinion for a long time, and I still mostly have Popple's opinion. But I will say that, like with Cherry, we've introduced seventy five companies to FreeBSD um, as part of the. Uh, the uh, Digital Catapults uh, Technology Access Program. For those people, the easiest thing for them is to be able to install a desktop with a reasonable development environment and get started porting their code. 
and they're finding that really easy. They're liking it better than it being a server um, or worse yet, a dev board. Um, and so it seems to be pretty valuable to give them something they're from reasonably familiar with they can get up and running on um, and get going quickly. And so like in this case, being the best isn't, isn't necessary. It's to have a reasonably low friction environment. And in our case, you know, we only have to support one board. We wrote the graphics driver. Um, so we, we've got a lot of advantages there. We're not, we don't have the problems that FreeBSD as a whole has with every rando laptop in the universe. But, but if the computer don't come to FreeBSD for the desktop, it comes for other stuff. Yeah. But uh, you'll they, be able to use desktop easily like lowers the bar. Well, it lower, lowers the bar. They have a fairly short cycle, I think six months <coughs> basically working on Cherry stuff. Um, many of them, though, have asked to keep the boards, so they're running. They're running Cherry BSD, which is free BSD, um, and they're continuing to use it, integrating it into their CI environment and whatnot. So, like, it's it's really nice to be able to give them something something familiar, like because they're going to have some bumps. They're going to be they you know they're finding things that are missing. So the fewer things that are missing or fewer things that are outside of their experience, um, that really helps. Uh, Maybe this mic beside that mic is. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah, put the back. What's that? I can. I might just take this. Back. Yeah. We'll start, we'll start with this one, though. Just hold both mics. Yeah, hold both mics. I got a promo back with that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of the, uh, from the, from the users. I'm from Beckhoff. And, um, for us, the selling point from FreeBSD and not taking Linux was the license. So um, from license perspective for our customers, um, FreeBSD is best. So um, this is one point. And we invest a lot into this uh, graphics um, uh, because our customers, they, they run um, industrial automation uh, PCs. So normally you wouldn't expect them to use uh, graphics or something. But when you look look further, the m our controllers control some machines and you don't need a GUI for this, but they are always operators and they want to operate this. Of course, they could use uh, a Windows PC or Linux PC or Mac, but they want to use the same system. And sometimes they want to integrate both there. So we have a need for uh, for graphics on our industrial automation machines, so um, we, yeah, we, we for us it's it's a use case and we invest into it and we need it, and I want to second it that we have to, we are a smaller community, so we have to make a focus on one desktop environment and just focus and work together on it. So if you say KDE, I'm going for KDE. Um, Actually, we are doing it because <coughs> I had one question. In Sherry BSD, do you use uh, X11 or Wayland? <coughs> Perfect, <laughs> we too. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So, it's, it's it's a good focus because we work in the in the same direction. No. Check. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, was gonna, I, was gonna, well, I will come back. Yeah, so I, I have to keep shouting uh, shouting Discord out because they they they're providing some good commentary along uh, alongside everyone else here. But um, but I'll I'll also intersperse some of my my own stuff. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, just um, so um, yeah, Sean Sean also says again, you know, some stuff about um, you know, also lack of marketing, you know, like there's also just so actually to expand upon that, there's actually a couple of um, couple of YouTube like FreeBSD specific uh, YouTubers in Discord. Um, they actually you know make content literally about how to um how to do desktop type stuff in FreeBSD. So there there's a bit of marketing going on, but even though you know when you actually you know, search on your favorite search engine, you'll see how to do X in Linux, you know, stuff like that. But, um, but really just, I mean, when, when it comes to just even getting newer folks into our community, I mean, Discord is probably, like, these days, Discord's probably one of the biggest, like, big, one of the biggest sources for them. Um, and the mindset is very much different than probably, you know, what a lot of us kind of came in, like, what a, a lot of our vil villain origin stories were so but um i think we can still have a kind of a diversity in in um in desktop environments i mean kde from from my perspective is very very heavy compared to some of the other ones um you know different different environments they all have you know different attributes i mean i use cinnamon i maintain cinnamon um stuff like that but um you know i was gonna get where i was going with that but uh <laughs> but you know just just um yeah <laughs> oh I'll, I'll, I'll remember at some point so I, one comment that i want to make is that um i mean i don't think it's the foundation's uh intent to either um uh to, to say, you know, we want to make FreeBSD the absolute best desktop operating system. That's like that's, that's, that's not, why I was trying to go and get, get, get that's not, that, that is, that isn't the goal of, of this uh, item on, on here. It really is, you know, to, to make FreeBSD a credible um, desktop environment, particularly for people who are um, developers and who are working on FreeBSD. Um, that's sort of, you know, that's our, our, the primary motivation. If, um, uh, if people who are not in the developer community also want to use it, that's that's excellent. But I mean, the, the goal really is to have um, have a platform where developers themselves can um, uh, can have a usable environment. Um, and it's also, I think, um, it's it's very much the case that you know the foundation has um, limited resources, and we're not trying to um, uh, to sort of you know, say we, we can step in and fund all of the effort across all of um, uh, um, desktop uh, use cases. Um, but I think really it is about um, basically trying to um, reduce friction and make a good experience for, you know, the prototypical kind of uh, case of either a, a student trying to install an OS on their laptop for the first time or, or as mentioned, right, if, if someone's using FreeBSD graphics in, um, uh, in a production commercial use case. Like there are actually um, uh, several of those, uh, those instances that are not very um, vocal or, or public about it, but that, that do use FreeBSD um, or have used FreeBSD in a sort of graphics uh, uh, environment. Um, Warner, I think you had a comment. And I'm gonna come back to Pavel afterwards. Sorry. Yeah, trying to listen to a YouTube video about my talk later, but um, so uh, it bit me. Um, I just wanted to kind of echo what I'm hearing. Um, when I was at Timing Solutions 20 years ago, we ran FreeBSD with X on really old monitors because that's the technology we had and it was good enough. And so I think a lot of the efforts, I'm going to echo a little bit of what Ed said, a lot of the efforts should be a good enough environment, which for a long time, we didn't have a good enough environment. We had a high police crash the system environment, which nobody could use. Um, and finding ways to leverage other people's work through the K Linux KPI and other ways, I think are, are important. And I also want to make sure that Charlie's point about people on Discord have a different mindset. <laughs> it's not bad, it's not good, it's just different. And I think there's a lot of energy there that we can um, make use of um, and that we can give people with their mindset 
a good experience. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that is and what we need that we don't have or any of that. I'm more of the gray beard generation. So um, I just wanted to make those points. I, I talk a little bit about attracting new people, having a, a pipeline for um, new developers in the um, working group for uh, workflow and Git and stuff later today. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But I, I do think a lot of the stuff will dovetail into that. And there's someone in the back, too. I don't know if you noticed. Thanks. Thanks, Warner. Yeah, I saw Andy's uh, hand, so I'm going to go to Andy next and then come back to uh, Pavel afterwards. So I applaud making a decision. Yay. Go with it. Um, I personally don't agree with KDE, but that's a <laughs> personal choice. But the fact is making a stand, going with it, rather, I mean, we could bike shed until the cows come home over this environment, that environment, or whatever else. Uh, and so taking that stand, going with it, people aren't going to like it. That's fine. Um, we're not taking away the option of installing their preferred desktop. It's just when you open the box, it works, right? Um, and I think that's crucial to get more developers and more people to buy in and get on with it. Um, to Asahi's point of we took, you know, we made a decision, whatever else. My background's with SUSE and OatSUSE. And for, I mean, they were always known as the KDE desktop uh, environment distro for a long time. They then made a switch to GNOME for many years. And then they went, actually, it doesn't really matter. So you choose what you want. And if you don't know what you want, you'll get something out of the box. Uh, and I think, you know, basically my point is, I think taking a stand is great. We can always iterate on it. There'll be some discussions. Don't be afraid of haters, because haters are going to hate regardless of what happens. Uh, and so I think it's great that there's progress. And for me, that's always clunky when it comes to installing FreeBSD. I'm, I'd be delighted to be able to get it to install and I don't have to worry about oh, what are the magic runes I need and, and whatever else to get an environment that just works for what I want it to do. Thank you guys for the comments. I actually I feel convinced. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's uh, uh, and I definitely like agree with uh, like uh, because uh, I'm sorry Charlie's comment uh, or basically different window manager or different environment. Of course, nobody is blocking this, right? But in terms of uh, FreeBSD Foundation, we have to like they have to like. Uh, uh, like be able to uh, uh, to say how much they can support, right? So they cannot support a variety of things. They have to focus. And I like this narrow focus. And for example, when I was running FreeBSD on my laptop, I really wanted to not even like uh, have a window manager that works, but also just tell me which laptop works, where suspend resume works, the Wi-Fi works, everything just works. So, and I will buy this laptop. So. If FreeBSD would support one laptop very well, that would be great, right? Uh, and not like 10 laptops badly, right? So, uh, uh, and uh, and going back to like differentiators, because I can share my personal uh, story, like with my company, we are not a large company, right? But we have large competitors. And whenever we try to like, uh, chase them in terms of like functionality we will always lose because we don't have that much resources right to too much uh, like entire uh, spectrum of features etc right but i i i definitely like see in open source like i remember even before i started with freebsd that freebsd was really uh have really great scuzzy support and i think that's because of justin's uh, uh, among others, so uh, 
And I remember this was a differentiator that uh, FreeBSD was really good at storage at some point. And, uh, and people were choosing FreeBSD because of that. And when OpenSolaris uh, appeared, people were actually, of course, it was way too late to, <laughs> to save some, uh, but uh, people were really considering OpenSolaris because it has features that really differentiate it that you couldn't find anywhere else, like they trace ZFS initially zones and stuff like that so uh, so i think this is uh, something that would be good to consider uh, how freebsd can find a niche that we are the best right yeah that's a really good point and i and i i completely agree with that like i think that we need to have things in freebsd where we are innovative where we we are the best at something um I think that things like our, you know efforts on desktop um, support, the goal is not to be the number one desktop, but it's it's to remove barriers that would prevent someone from being able to access the the things that we really want to pursue. Right, we want to segue, use this, and then segue. So so I kind of remembered. So like you know actually running a desktop, and and I, and I totally agree with 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 all the sentiments about like we don't need to be the best we just got to be got to be good enough that someone can someone can install it and reasonably use it but when you're actually running a desktop it's or driving a desktop focused you know system compared to a more server or headless system is a very different experience to the point where even on bugzilla even on whichever project um project resource that we have to you know report and fix stuff um though it's like for those of us in the desktop space it's very telling when someone's just like it's like oh like you should try this is like no it doesn't work it doesn't work like that in desktop space because you can't just you can't really for example in, in some of the more tightly packed ones you have to test you have to test the whole thing together you can't do it piecemeal that that that's just one attribute to it but but really I, I actually wanted to segue more into like kind of the development process being able to use desktop to actually aid development of the other parts of FreeBSD. For instance, even the something that we could really differentiate ourselves with is literally the um, our cross-build support. You know, now that we have rather mature LLVM, both in the base system, but also with external tool chain, and we can do a lot more things with that. And I know, I, I know myself, I use QEMU user a little bit more than I would like. Um, and that's something, you know, especially when, when you only have like one one big beefy machine that's one architecture but you got to build it for a whole bunch of other ones in your Fujia jails or whatever um you know being able to being able to aid that as well so so just want to say something uh to respond to pavel um, so your, your sentiment that we should kind of focus more on like, it, for example, a particular laptop, we have had some discussions with, uh, uh, some people at framework, um, were interested. They kind of fell off for the last couple months. Um, but I know Mark and Ed have framework laptops and we're, it's, it's on our, our radar again to, um, think about making framework like the FreeBSD laptop or putting some effort into that direction. Um, the other thing I would say is that <clears throat> I think we're, we've made a lot of headway. What, what, I mean, what do we really want? Most of us, it's a browser, a terminal and an editor. I think we've come a long way if we, if we just have that, um, uh, maybe people that want KDE, people that want something different, you know, a package install, whatever, um, is still an option, but yeah, I think that's about it. All right, I think that's um, about the extent of what I have for um, uh, the slide content that I wanted to go through. Um, we do have a few minutes uh, left, so if there's any other discussion that um, uh, or comments that people want to make, um, I'm happy to pass the mic around a little bit more. Um, if there's any areas of interest that you think are, are not represented in what we've talked about but are important, um, I'm happy to hear about those as well. Well, we did 
missing when you won't have it. It's just really good to really think about your distance time. Okay, well, in that case, then uh, thank you for your uh, feedback and input in this session, and we'll have a, a little bit of an extended time for um, uh, just hacking and development and such. And we'll, uh, when, are we, when are we back, John? In, uh, yeah, we'll try to get back on schedule. So yeah. I think we'll start water off at 3.30. Okay. Is the team is fine to be done by then, Lauren? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you.
Okay, so we're live on the stream. My name is Warner Losh. This is Lee Wynn. Um, he'll be starting here in a second. Um, we've got our slides, um, or at least Lee Wynn has his slides. I'm not that organized yet to have my slides here. I'll put them up after the talk. Um, and we also have a place for HackMD notes. So if people in the crowd could take notes while we're talking. And with that, I'm going to uh, start the slides uh, with Lee Wynn. To, who's going to talk about the CI work that he's been doing. Okay. Thanks, Warner. So, yeah, so uh, in the beginning, this talk is uh, just doing state, status update for testing in SDI. However, I feel people might be more interested in the second topic, uh, how far are we from pre-commit CI, but uh, please, let me introduce the updates uh, of our testing and uh, CI because uh, even we, we have uh, pre-committed CI, however, uh, we still need the test to, to run. Anyway, uh, so uh, for people didn't join the past two uh, dev summit in Asia and the EuroBSD Con, uh, you can check the the, my presentation there, however, uh, yeah, because that was first, those two were uh, first the status update after uh, we don't have a physical meeting, in-person meetings uh, for three years. Anyway, and uh, uh, since this much, uh, we have some uh, uh, little, little improvements of the testing things. Uh, so we have GCC 12 build for stable 13 uh, uh, branch. And uh, please note that currently our main current branch is failing again with GCC 12. So uh, I think there are two uh, uh, errors here. One is in our base, the other is in uh, open ZFS code, import the open ZFS code. So uh, maybe I need to, because I've been talking with uh, uh, open ZFS developer while we were both in uh, uh, HRV at Zikang, and uh, he's, he says that uh, they are also interested in having FreeBSD CI and uh, improving their CI. Status. So maybe I will work with them more and uh, see if we can also push uh, GC, newer GCC build in OpenZFS and the FreeBSD. So hope luck can, uh, I mean, it's always good to stop things in the upstream. And uh, the other thing is uh, we have uh, uh, kernel address sanitizer on stable and unstable 13, ND64, and uh, uh, UNS64 for main branch is also added, and uh, uh, that was in, that, that was added uh, a month ago. However, I had a uh, still be configuration error, but that was fixed. Uh, uh, I think one or two weeks ago. And uh, uh, those are the current work in progress. Uh, I am trying to add in new hardware to uh, not only uh, add, uh, adding new hardware in our uh, cluster, but also talking to uh, many people about using cloud resource or other uh, building resource from other organizations. So uh, because we, uh, for doing tests, uh, always a uh, lot of computing power needed. And uh, uh, we also want to enable some uh, non-X80X uh, architectures uh, test. Currently we do have uh, tests for uh, non x86 testers, but but that w that's running on QMU and uh, it's very slow. One wrong one full tester run could take about 
uh, 12 to 16 hours. So we can do only do that once a day. And uh, uh, hopefully running things on native hardware can make things uh, much faster. And uh, I'm also uh, uh, trying to add new more jobs for different testing uh, provided by requests by other people. So uh, please don't hesitate, hesitate to submit a PR to free BDCI report on GitHub. And uh, uh, I know that the configuration and the scripts are very complicated layer. So uh, I was, if you can deal with that, that would be great. Or uh, in most of, most of cases, just submit a build SH for just give me a concept of what you <laughs> want to run. That's fine. And uh, I will try to convert that into a job uh, and uh, running continuously. And uh, lo the following three are some, uh, I shouldn't say side project, but other uh, testing jobs are I'm working, I'm working with other people. The first thing is the continue, uh, uh, the continued task of our uh, GSTAC project last year. And uh, uh, one of the use to have WTAP, uh, our uh, wireless simulator, uh, is we can use that for uh, doing, doing uh, for writing tests uh, for our L2 net L2.11 stack. So uh, there, are, uh, there are already some full of concept and uh, basic tests uh, in the review. So if you are interested, please search uh, WTAP in our uh, fabricator. And uh, the other is uh, hardware test bay. That project uh, we, you might have heard uh, several years ago, uh, that was trying to build a physical hardware uh, testing cluster, mainly test for testing uh, in variables like Raspberry Pi or uh, uh, Pi64 volts. So uh, that including building some physical controlling boards for uh, doing things like swapping the, the SD card and uh, for doing full, uh, full a complete test for uh, those hardware. And uh, the other thing is uh, uh, we are checking with, uh, I'm checking with Olivia to see if we can uh, uh, add more physical and uh, real uh, network performance test using our resource at our network cluster. So the basic idea is uh, automate, automate the environment setup and uh, uh, system, system installation and uh, run some uh, 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 network performance uh, test uh, like uh, packet forwarding or NIT or some, something like that. So that's an effort talking with Olivia and uh, uh, that's also stored uh, a while, but uh, we are, we, we, resu we resume our uh, uh, weekly meeting for uh, uh, discuss how to how to do that. Okay. So, uh, how far from we from uh, having pre the CI? So that uh, question uh, can be answered in different uh, labels. So uh, I know that people when here uh, pre the CI we. Most people Im image a full automatic, automated, automized uh, solution, just like a, a automaker check while you submit a 
pull request on GitHub. Uh, I would say that includes many uh, 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 low-level work or complicating scripting work. So uh, that's still uh, working progress. But uh, before having all those things automatically, we need to have something can run uh, by hand first. So uh, currently, uh, there are two there are two pages from Moin, uh, which enables developers and the contributors can run CI more easily on their local environment. Uh, what those what those two uh, pages do? are uh, yeah, doing two things. First is trying to integrate the comp complicated uh, script on, in FreeBSD CI repository into our uh, source repository. So at least uh, there could be some uh, uh, make file targets. So you can build your, uh, you can build your uh, CI environment and uh, build a, or build a, a, a VN image just like uh, what we are running in uh, the CI system. So uh, that, that's a, those are the things we are uh, trying in the first phase. And uh, the other thing is uh, we are after integrating those scripts into uh, uh, the main source repository, we can use those things to uh, to we can we can we can use those scripts to run uh, uh, tests uh, on uh, external hosted CI service. For example, currently uh, we have some efforts about uh, running. Uh, test uh, on series CI uh, connect to our uh, main GitHub GitHub repository. So uh, there are already some uh, excellent excellent reviews and comments for those two uh, those two pages. Uh, one thing I did like to uh, revise or suggest is let's. Firstly, just focusing on the layout and the mechanism of this workflow. Uh, let's just uh, ignore the dirty or work around parts of what. Uh, I mean, if you look at the those scripts, you will see lots of scoop, lots of scripts from uh, FreeBSD CI repository, uh, such as disable. Uh, uh, Infeasible tests or doing some uh, uh, system adjustment for just uh, for for fulfill some uh, test requirements. Uh, I don't think we need to uh, focusing on those things at this point. So we are just focusing on things like building uh, building building test. Uh, virtual machine image and uh, uh, and uh, how to launch, how to run those tests and uh, how to get the results. But the, uh, the test itself is, uh, that's also an important task, but that can be uh, treated sep separately. So again, please test and uh, give feedback of those tests uh, from the work from from Moin's work, and uh, uh, after we can after we have those uh, testing infrastructure in our tree, the next thing is uh, that's a com combine work with the uh, Git working flow because the ultimate goal is we want to have a system uh, developers and uh, contributors can just submit uh, or staging their 
uh, changes. And uh, there is a system to automatically run all the necessary tests. Then uh, that page can be merged by just a uh, click of the developer or uh, maybe just merged by an automatic system. So uh, for fulfill that, uh, currently we still think it would be good to have a self hosted service because uh, that's better to be uh, controlled by ourselves and uh, uh, we can do more finer grand uh, 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 adjustment or control of our things. So uh, currently uh, I am surveying and evaluating some hosted solution for they can provide pull request or most most of them are called merge request solution. So uh, those are few, those are some uh, require, requirements for this system. Uh, the first, of course, it should be able to integrate with the current freebsd.org infra. And uh, uh, for, because people like GitHub, GitHub uh, workflow, so just, uh, fork things, submit a pull request. However, uh, for non-GitHub solution, currently uh, uh, a fork will, will need to create a full clone of the, the repository, which means that one, one uh, clone of the main repository will take exactly the same size of the original uh, repository and uh, uh, because our code base is very large uh, we have about 1.5 gigabytes for our source repository and 2.2 uh, gigabytes for post repository so each uh, each user and the developers uh, 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 fork will take one to two gigabytes uh, uh, of our uh, system, so the disk, disk space will be a problem. Uh, there are some solutions for that, and uh, uh, we are still testing testing that. And uh, finally, because we need to, uh, uh, just like our other systems, we need to have accounts for both developers and the contributors, and uh, one of the issues of, of our freebd.org uh, developing services that currently we have very uh, uh, not centralized uh, uh, authentication system, which is honestly be an, an, an issue for that. So uh, by taking this chance, we are also looking at our uh, single sign-on issue, a single sign-on solution for, for this. So uh, all those efforts are not uh, telling, uh, I mean, those things are uh, just a su survey and uh, evaluation task, which is not uh, telling uh, people, this is the direction we are going to do. Uh, this is for helping the working flow uh, working group uh, to understand what things may look like and uh, uh, helping them to figure out what are the things we 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 really want. So uh, I hope I can have a beta or uh, maybe it can be just called alpha testing system by the end of this uh, quarter. Uh, in the beginning, it might just uh, give developers to to check, but uh, over time, uh, I we have to uh, open public beta testing for let all the contributors to to uh, test on this on this system. After all, uh, having this system is trying to reduce the friction of. Uh, uh, contributors to submit their contribu contributions. So, uh, so not only for source, we are also 
checking for documentation and the prod, uh, ports. So we may, just like our Git migration, we may also use documentation repository for uh, 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 testing and the pilot for that. Okay. And uh, there are still something we uh, haven't had uh, a concrete thought about that. Uh, first thing is uh, ports. And uh, ports may be uh, also a, a common and a large request, but uh, port system and the port testing infrastructure are more compli uh, com complicated. And uh, uh, for ensure the uh, effect, effect, effectiveness, we also need to uh, do things like uh, have a, for example, a common, common uh, uh, package repository for avoiding uh, building the same things. Uh, 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 too many, too many, too many times because uh, everything related to LLVM or Rust could cause testing a port uh, taking a very long time. And uh, still, we are we we need to check how to uh, uh, decrease the difficulty of setting up and the run test in the local development environment. I think current, uh, currently what the uh, proposed solution from Moin, the two pages we uh, mentioned earlier, is a very good start. However, that still need to take uh, much, much resource and uh, uh, can only run from uh, uh, virtual machine. So over time, uh, our hope is trying to lower the, the uh, hardware and requirement of that and uh, trying to have some lighter weight solution for that. So uh, that's one of the uh, wishes we, we'd like to see in the future. And uh, uh, again, uh, just having a CI system, automatic pre-commit CI build a testing system uh, without having stable uh, tests is not enough. So uh, still we need to spend more time on uh, improving our test suite, test suite quality. Uh, at least we need to have a stable, uh, reliable test base. That's still, uh, there are still, uh, I would say, still many things can be, can be done here. And uh, f finally, uh, one thing we can consider is uh, to categorize our uh, current, current test suite. Because current, currently, uh, we have various types of uh, test cases in our test suite. And uh, uh, that's also one of the reasons our test suite are not very stable. So uh, in the future, we may need to uh, categorize and uh, uh, separate our test for uh, uh, categorize them into things like uh, doing smog test. So uh, developers can uh, run it to have a quick stainless check of his layer changes. And uh, we still need to run uh, full functional test after a uh, small test uh, complete. And uh, uh, maybe just uh, maybe one day or uh, longer time, we can run stress performance test for and uh, tracking the uh, 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 performance or other trend over time to ensure our, uh, not only the correctness, but also, uh, but also the other, other 
other things like performance, speed, or so. So uh, the current current status of the things I'm working on is uh, again the first phase of Git migration is done. Uh, however, I should I should say it's almost done. There are still some rough edges needs to uh, continue working on. One thing people uh, uh, asked for a long time is what's our what's the status of our uh, Git commit hooks uh, after migration from subversion. So uh, those things are still need sorting uh, and uh, we need to improve and uh, do some unify for those, those, uh, those hooks, uh, both from local side, like uh, currently we have different commit message template in three repositories. Uh, that's better to be uh, unified and have uh, and uh, uh, implement the current suggested uh, uh, practice. And uh, from the server side, uh, there are some uh, hooks need to be cleaned up and uh, 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 adjust for some uh, requests. One of the things is uh, people to people would like to see the commit mail uh, sender is from the author field of a git command instead of a, instead of the uh, committer field. That's one of the things uh, we need to discuss more and uh, uh, modify our uh, uh, hooks. So those things are still working on, but should be completed very soon. Uh, and uh, uh, not directly related to workflow, but uh, there are some advanced uh, or uh, there are some advanced uh, Git uh, uh, feature, not necessarily the security features. Uh, we may want we we want to uh, integrate to our current workflow. One of the things is like a commit signature or even uh, 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 signature on the git push comments. Those are the things we want to uh, check and uh, try to implement in our system. So uh, those are the things uh, uh, we probably want to into, uh, implement in our project and uh, that's also why we probably cannot use current hosted solution because those things are not uh, directly supported by current, uh, current uh, popular services like uh, GitHub or GitLab. So uh, again, uh, we are doing setting up the testing service for evaluation. We already have some working uh, staging service servers on uh, in freebie data cluster, uh, and uh, as I said, could be open for private test by the end of this quarter. So uh, for some technical details, uh, we are currently checking uh, GitT because current, uh, currently it looks, uh, meets our uh, request most. And uh, we do have some uh, developers and uh, users, uh, contributors are familiar with this, so we may uh, check it first. And uh, one of the things is it supports a workflow called agit, and uh, we probably don't have, don't need, and uh, uh, we don't have, have to uh, uh, apply the full agit workflow, but at least uh, it can, uh, we could solve the uh, fork hail problem from most uh, uh, hosted Git solution for us. So the basic idea is uh, for enable that, we can let developers and the users to just create a full or a merge request. Uh, they are basically the same thing, just different terms to our main repository without creating a fork uh, first. 
So uh, that's one of the things we are testing. And uh, uh, we are still working on uh, solving the issues of other uh, freebd.org service to uh, stop the integration and the authentication system uh, uh, solutions. And uh, we also need to check uh, how to migrate our current Git commit hooks to those systems because there are some uh, differences uh, in the in the low level system. Uh, just like for for example, things like what the environment variable you can get while receiving a push requirement, uh, while receiving a, a git push. That's the things we need to need to check more because for those things which can uh, affect things like how do we generate commit mail and so on. So uh, after all of this, uh, still we need to resume the workflow working group and uh, discuss what we have uh, found, uh, what we thought which might be useful for the project. So, uh, but still uh, workflow working group is the uh, one to uh, receive the, 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 the ideas and the comments and the discuss what's the most uh, suitable way for us. And uh, uh, people may uh, ask, uh, what will be our fabricator? Uh, the current idea would be, it may need to be decommissioned because some technical reasons, such as uh, supporting in the upstream and uh, the PHP version is used. Uh, thanks for mowing. he uh, he did many uh, low-level and uh, system administration tasks for uh, uh, maintaining our fabricator, fabricator system. Uh, so there is still an option to upgrade uh, or migrate our fabricator setup to the newly forked uh, maintained project called Forge. But, uh, we probably still need to think about what's the long-term workflow we need, because it's probably not a good idea to just maintaining a two maintaining two systems uh, have similar uh, features for a project. So that's the thing we are uh, also checking. But uh, I need to mention that even we are uh, going to drop a uh, fabricator in the future, we may uh, turn fabricator into read-only mode for, and uh, keep it running for um, certain, certain time to ensure the existing works in fabricator won't be dropped. Okay, so uh, finally, as I said, uh, we need lots of efforts for uh, improving the testing in our uh, test suite and the CI system. So please help to check the uh, current open uh, open ticket assigned to FreeBSD testing at FreeBSD.org. And uh, if you are interested in uh, helping the, the survey of the solutions we are going to use, please uh, join the uh, uh, Git Convert, Git Convert uh, uh, channel currently on Fnet and also Bridge to Slack. So uh, the, for for do it, for uh, further discussions and the, the last three uh, arrows are some. Uh, uh, information collecting or some idea of the current CI systems. So uh, hope people can help contribute for this. Uh, I will mention that the first two uh, is also very important because uh, I think for our CI work, uh, it should not be limited only for uh, testing FreeBSD. 
but we I also like to see uh, we push FreeBSD testing to other projects to let other projects can uh, test FreeBSD while their development. So we don't have to, we we don't we don't I mean because currently in ports we sometimes have to uh, porting a software after they released. I hope that in the future uh, they no software can release along with FreeBSD support by default. That will be uh, much lower the, the effort needed by horse people. So yeah, I think that's all. Well, thank you, Wee Wen. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions at this point, or should I get on with my quick um, GitHub uh, pull request uh, report? Okay, GitHub pull request report. Thank you, Lee Wen. Okay, so um, at the beginning of the year, I basically started running an experiment to see if we could get more uh, patches into the tree if we started responding more quickly and more timely to GitHub pull requests. Sorry. Um, so I announced it. Uh, we got a bunch of pull requests. Some of them were good, but we also got some that were undesirable. Um, and those were, hi, here's a bunch of style fixes. Hi, here's a bunch of typo fixes. Hi, um, here's a bunch of let's return from main rather than call exit from main fixes. Um, and while they might be OK, there, um, we need to find some way to set boundaries so that the people looking at these uh, pull requests, um, it's a good use of their time. Um, on the one hand, we do want to welcome uh, contributions from the community. And on the other hand, we want to make sure that those contributions are worth our time. And that will be a balancing act. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was when I provided better guidance through the uh, contributors.md file, which is displayed whenever anybody submits a pull request, um, that uh, the pull request got better. Um, and we got more requests that we could uh, do something about and land. Um, so um, in the FreeBSD project, we've had about 3,000 commits since uh, January, 3,044, I think was the number on the local repository I had that was synced through noonish today. Um, 151 were marked as having being pull requests, although uh, two or three of those were ZFS merges that had the phrase, um, notable pull request includes R this. So um, uh, that number is not 100% accurate, but it looked like we had 74 um, unique pull requests mentioned. Um, just by sorting through and looking at the pull request URL. Um, when we started the year, we were at pull request 635, and now we're at pull request 745. And what that means is we've had 110 pull requests in the last uh, four, four and a half months. Um, there are 25 that are still open. We started the year with about 100 open. Um, so we have a little bit of a backlog. Um, uh, about half of these could be committed. A couple should just be closed, and the rest are kind of in the uh, in-between zone. Maybe it'll be worth it if the author makes a couple of small tweaks. Um, it's almost ready. It's not worth rejecting, but we can't commit it just yet. Um, and so right now, the oldest is from November of last year, um, which is getting up to be about six months. I hope to have that one close soon. The second oldest one is from January. So we don't have a huge long tail of old requests. Um, so that was beneficial. Um, for the pull requests that needed work, when we provided feedback saying, hey, do this, this, and this, that's crisp, actionable, and specific, uh, the pull requests improve. When we maybe suggested that this or that should happen, that the contributors had trouble reading our minds. So this kind of mirrors what we know from other management feedback operations that if you tell people exactly what to do, uh, they tend to do it better. 
Um, also, uh, if you notice the numbers don't quite add up um, uh, because uh, some pull requests resulted in multiple commits, and um, there's not exactly a one-to-one -one mapping because we didn't uh, mark everything um, uh, well during the uh, during the experiment. Um, we had uh, seven or eight people landing pull requests, uh, which was good. Um, it was good to see people, another couple um, also provided feedback. Um, and that was good to a point. Um, so what we learned from this is fast feedback is critical. If a pull request comes in and you get something to them within a week or two um, and you can iterate quickly, uh, that uh, means that the submitter is enthusiastic uh, and any enthusiasm they have uh, will uh, not be lost by us ignoring it for a while. Um, this is something we all kind of intuitively know. We've been hearing for years about, um, uh, I submitted this fix and it was no good, or it was good, but nobody paid attention to it for three or four or five years. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that we need to, whatever tooling we use, whatever process we have, we need to try to avoid because that um, not only squanders any improvements to the system we might get, but also squanders a lot of goodwill from the contributors. Um, we need to probably tighten up the guidance that we have for contributors so that it's clear what we accept, what we want to do in a particular uh, venue. Uh, having good guidance will get us better results and make it worth our valuable time better or more so that we can uh, provide um, better feedback, provide um, uh, more focused attention because the things, uh, the requests that we get will be closer to what we uh, consider acceptable. Um, good funneling to the right tool is also required. Um, we get a lot of bug fixes in Bugzilla, but they're hard to discover and they're hard to get in front of the right people, so they tend to languish. The, this experiment was um, an attempt to try to get um, those sorts of things in front of people quickly. So, oh yeah, that's clearly a bug fix, I can fix that. And it was my hope that we could do um, several hundred of these. Um, and it turned out that we didn't get um, a lot of good requests that were easy, no-brainers. We got a lot of them that were in the in-between zone, and we had there were several in the uh, I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know how to tell this person I'm not. This is never going to make it in, because um, I don't want to just say that. But you know, so part of what we need um, is good guidance for reviewers on how to say, hey, yeah, this um, this uh, submission that you've done it looks good, but it needs to be split up in these ways or. Um, the submission uh, uh, we're not interested in, it's just a style commit. We usually don't take those and find some way, kind of a scripty way for some of these things to, to, to mention that without um, uh, you know, being insulting or turning off the con contributor. Um, there's also quite a bit of friction for, you know, if, you, if a patch came into Bugzilla, getting it into the source tree is a multi-step manual process. If it comes into GitHub, it's um, also a manual process. There are few manual steps. Uh, I wrote a script to help with the script um, things from GitHub, and it helped me a lot. I was able to land most of the pull requests I did within just a few minutes because the script took care of all the mechanical um, details that we like to have in our commit messages um, without uh, my having to sit there and type them all individually. Um, but uh, the tooling isn't quite there yet. Um, there are details that can be missed in the conversation that uh, takes place on GitHub that um, you're not going to necessarily see. The tooling isn't going to alert you uh, to them. Um, so sometimes when somebody has a slightly different name than what the authors are, you might miss that. So that's another area that we need to hone our process a little bit on. Uh, and I have a lot of uh, words up here. I'll try to be brief. I know it's getting late in the day. Um, one of the things that I realized um, during this is that we don't have a good enough focus on onboarding. So what I mean by that is 
when somebody comes with a contribution, we're not as an accepting a community as other communities. We don't put them in touch with the right people. We don't proactively, there's nobody's out there um, proactively trying to make the connections. Now, a lot of us here in the room have made a number of connections over the years. We know whether networking things that um, we talk to um, some set of people, if they're bootloader things, we talk to other people. Um, people new to the project don't, don't have that information. And so one of the challenges we have is how do we um, uh, connect people to the right people when they have submissions? Um, and the other thing is we don't have a very deep pipeline of that right now because we've been really bad at accepting submissions, really bad about um, harvesting um, and harnessing the, and encouraging the enthusiasm people have when they first come to FreeBSD to keep that alive. Uh, so our bench is kind of uh, getting thin right now, and that's something that we need to um, attend to. Good tooling will help that, but we'll also need um, good uh, um, additional time from people um, whose, um, for lack of a better word, whose job it is, is to make sure that the, the connections happen and the new people are uh, more welcomed. Um, there's a, some technical issues with GitHub. Right now, we're, the way we're landing um, Git, uh, the way we're merging uh, pull requests, um, doesn't look like a pull request was merged to GitHub. It looks um, like uh, we just closed the, the pull request. So um, and that made it hard to figure out what the stats were. The stats that I had earlier in my slides, I kind of put together by um, running a number of different greps on our uh, source tree, which is okay, but um, you know, if we're gonna do this, we'll want to pay attention to the metrics and we can't be doing it by hand all the time. Um, and then finally, uh, we need to expand the, um, some of the concepts of committer and reviewer um, uh, so that, uh, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say here, so that um, we can grow the community a little bit more uh, so that it's not, the rules don't seem to be so rigid. Anybody can do the review uh, in, the, in theory, so it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who has their commit bit, um, but our processes are just kind of set up a little bit towards, biased towards that because of the way we land commits. Um, so that's all I have from, that's all I have from that. Uh, and then, um, wrong clicks. Uh, one of the things, this is kind of a preview, um, Lee Wynn touched on this a little bit in his portion of the talk. Um, I'm going to start up the workflow working groups, um, and what they'll be is a place for people that are working in this area to get together, um, for people like uh, Igor, who is working on forge experiments to be able to talk to people to say, hey, yeah, these are going well, or these are going bad, or somewhere in between, for people working on um, GitHub stuff or CGIT stuff to um, you know, talk to each other and report out and maybe provide a little bit of a framework so that things don't linger so much. Some people work better when there's a cadence that they have to report against. Oh, I gotta talk about this this week. Okay, I guess I better do something to report. Uh, it's kind of a silly thing, but um, it actually does tend to work out in practice. I'll be starting these in June, um, so keep your eyes open. And I guess um, now if anybody has any questions, we can do that as well. We have the questions microphone, slightly customized from earlier. So this is just relaying a question from uh, IRC. The uh, pull request stats that you showed earlier. Yes. Is that source only? That is source only. Um, I did not pull the stats for docs or ports. Um, partially, that's my own uh, myopic vision. And also, I didn't have the repositories handy on my laptop that I brought to the conference. It's kind of a silly reason not to. Um, um, have you or others um done any efforts on pull requests in source or uh, or in, in ports or, or doc, do you know? Um, I don't really think about ports so much. I haven't seen 
uh, very many ports pull requests. I get email for all the requests. There's more going on in Doc, and there's more feedback going on in Doc, and uh, the Doc team um, has been more proactive in that, and that's the sort of place where, hey, I fixed a bunch of typos. That works out really well for, for our documentation. So uh, from that perspective, um, I think they've done uh, an okay job, um, uh, but I don't know if uh, what their expectations were with it. <laughs> is there any way that we can do something other than make it look like we're closing those pull requests? Because, uh, I mean, that, that stat just looks bad for someone coming into GitHub and saying, so, you know, how many of these things did they merge and which ones did they close? Oh, they yep, closed all uh, of there them. There are two people with their hands up. We have Brad and Brooks right behind you. And maybe um, Ed knows, too. Ed posted a link to the issue when this came up. So there, there is, so GitHub doesn't care how the commit lands, but I don't know how it matches. If it has to be exactly the same hash or something else, because we, we, we use the fact that it knows, um, that, that it doesn't care how it lands to close all, like our CI PRs in CherryBSD merges. Right. Because we actually have it set up, so we, GitHub is actually broken. Um, in that you can't do a rebase, you can't do, like uh, a, you can't do a fast forward merge. It has to rebase it, which means if there are any merge commits, it doesn't work. Um, so, and then you have to do a merge. So we, we use the fact that it's, at least in some cases, smart enough. It may be that we want to, t we want to encourage people to turn on the thing where projects can edit the commit. So we, you could then make the commit match what you're going to push, and that might do the right thing. But okay, that, I'll have to experiment People have with to that. opt into that, and I don't know if it would really work, but it might, it uh, might work. Otherwise, probably not. Yeah, because the, 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 we, we can't actually modify the main branch on uh, GitHub because our source of truth is, is elsewhere. But I'll have to try that experiment. I had no idea that you could, could do that. That's good information. Okay. Yeah, but it has to be the same hash. That's why we'll put us because we'll do a manual push to the same exact hash. So okay. Now you've got it into your main, their thing, and then turn around and push that as the main. It would work. Okay, I'll have to I'll have to do some experiments with that. So, Brad was next, and then we'll talk to you, Charlie. Yeah, we have this uh, with pfSense. So there's a a script I can liberate and give to you. Because we have we have the same process. We have an internal GitLab that pushes to GitHub, right? And so we take you know pull requests from outside from GitHub, pull them in. So I'll see if, if I can. You, get if that you out. have a script, I would love I would love to see that. Um, yeah, let me take uh, that and out. See if we can use it. That would be great. I, that's that's a that's that's really good, Brad. Thank you. Do do uh, the pull requests get marked as merged though, or or do they just show as closed? Yeah, they you know, merged, commit, whatever into master. It actually shows up fully as merged. Okay, so I don't know if the microphone picked that up, but Brad's saying that and showing Ed that the um, commit winds up fully merged, showing up that in their in their GUI. So I'll I'll use that and experiment on that, or you can do the experiment and show me what I'm doing wrong. Right? Yeah, I'm easy. So Charlie, I think was next. He, yeah, he, he had his yeah. hand up. I'm 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 just going through, just like skimming through GitHub's documentation, and pretty much everything it suggests is that. Um, like so, like like how we, how we traditionally do things in our repositories is something. If it's if it's from someone else, it's kind of like a kind of like a cherry pick. Or if we do it, it's just a regular commit. Um, for uh, it looks like from my skimming of the particular, you know, merging pull request section, um, it 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 almost seems like they specifically want it to be a merge commit of some sort. Um, I know when I when I committed some or or um submitted some stuff to the uh, Python cryptography project a, a little while ago, um, my pull request was actually a series of commits because because you know I was trying to I was trying to bump their CI and and a whole bunch of other work that had to be separate commits, right. and they they actually just squashed it using I believe their web interface for that, um, but it was still a merge commit. Um, I think there was a, there was another case where a few times I've I've pushed some stuff to the 
to the um, open SSL uh, Rust crate repository. And um, that they actually kind of sometimes they'll do it in like two steps where there's a separate approve button. Right. And then and then I think they merge it. So we might be able to we might be able to get around it somewhat with maybe that approve button to kind of show that it's like, hey, like these were approved and then they're committed or something like that. Right. Some of the some of the commits that I've landed have gone through the GitHub approval basis. But if it's looking for a particular hash, the GitHub PR script rewrites the commit message so we get a new hash. So yeah. that 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 might mean I need to turn on editing of the commit and push that before I do the merge, yeah, before I merge so there's a paper trail. So I'll need to figure that out. Um, there is a way to, to do the merges without doing, I was able to in um, a private repo, do the merge with a, a rebase, but there's not a merge commit, so you have the linear history. One of the things we've talked about is relaxing the no merge so that very slightly, just a little bit, yeah, it's a, little, <clears throat> a little bit of evil, not much, hardly worth mentioning. Um, but uh, so that if it's um, a merge commit back from main, that that is uh, uh, that would be allowed to be pushed because um, that might be the thing we need to do to get GitHub to notice. But if we're changing the hashes, we might just be able to push and still retain the linear history. So we're, you know, this is the sort of experiment that we would run and talk about in the um, uh, in the GitHub or the workflow groups. You know, oh, we tried this. You know, and then maybe the next time we would talk about, hey, I tried landing commits from Forge, um, and with this script it works great, or it doesn't work great, or this is what I found. So that's that's the sort of thing. The, the small experiments, the incremental steps. Maybe we need to take big steps at some point, um, and those would also be talked about and planned as the individual steps um, are going on. Next question. Charlie has another question. <laughs> Or a comment, that's fine. Comments are good. Yeah, so I so like actually stepping away from GitHub just a little bit, I actually wanted to go back to like even the even like the review process a little bit, but because it's not necessarily, you know, GitHub or anything anything tooling related, although we did have a although, you know, Bugzilla has been kinda, you know, maligned for partially good reasons. Um <laughs> You know, especially when it comes to you know discoverability and triage, I know there's I know there's a few of us who are um you know in unofficial or official capacities or somewhere in between who wanna who wanna improve you know like the just the triage training because mm -hmm. you know when you actually when again it's like it's like almost almost when someone who doesn't really know too much about you know ports and packaging finding out that it's a much harder problem than than it actually looks. You know, triage is actually very, it, it, very similar vein to that. It's like you, you think that you, you think that, oh, like you you go on Bugzilla or whichever tooling it is. You, you try to, you know, triage whatever, whatever comes in, try to get it to to the right place. And it turns out you did it completely wrong because you were missing some fundamental knowledge. But, you know, just just, just something to consider. I think the whole right, right. The, the whole triage thing, we, we, we might need to kind of kind of do like its own little I guess focus group or something I, th I think that would be great if we could find the people to do the focus group I could run it out of this group or I could run it as a separate thing or let somebody else run it I don't have to run things I'm just volunteering if there needs to be a facilitator um, and I would absolutely agree um, with the comments that you made that um, we need to have better triage we need to have better filtering we need to have better oops I did it wrong let's make it right which sometimes, you know, it gets triaged to the wrong place and, you know, it just drops off the face of the earth. So um, I absolutely agree with that and um, would love to see uh, any groups um, that want to make it better, make it better. I know that Mark Linneman would love to hand it off completely and be completely done. Even though he says he's done, he's not really done um, uh, in, entirely. So... Uh, I think that would be great. I would I would love to do whatever I can to facilitate that, um, or get out of the way of people doing it, whatever it takes.
All right. Any other questions, comments, whatnot? We've taken a whole hour and a little bit. Um, we're the last thing of the day, so I wasn't too worried about time. But uh, um, is there anything else you'd like to add, Lee Wynn, before we stop? Okay. So I guess I'll hand it back to um, Ed and John for whatever wrap-up they want to do. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Wonder. This mic is live all the time until they're back and do turned on and off. So or you could turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one plugged in? Mm, too big. Oh, yeah, you can just swap cables back. Oh, right. They gave me a special cable. Right. Oh. No, you're just a very special one. Uh, I try not to let it involve other people, but, you know, there's only so much. Uh, Oof, it's the end of the day. Sleep deprivation is getting to me. All right. Uh, so I do just want to say a few things at the end of our summit here. I know we're all looking forward to two days of talks at BSC Can too. Um, but first, I want to start off with thanking various folks. Um, the first group of folks I wanted to thank are our generous sponsors. So from when we did this at the beginning, but we'll do it again. Um, we had two gold sponsors this year, the foundation, or the FreeBSD Foundation. And TarSnap, who also donated the back of our shirts. We had, uh, well, come on, keyboard, you gonna work? There we go. We had two bronze sponsors, the Linux Professional Institute and Shrunaz. And as always, we also had a very much generous help from BSC CAN, um, coordinating and uh, working with the university for catering and so forth. And then I had a few other folks I just wanted to thank. Um, first of all, everyone who spoke or gave a talk or presented. Thank you for making sure that we didn't sit here for two days staring at each other. Um, thank you to all, everyone who came and also particip participated, I guess I could speak, mm -hmm. participated online, um, especially our interactive sessions, our planning and so forth, um, and for just being here and for hanging out last night for pizza and so forth. So thank you all for coming. Y'all can clap for yourselves. Thank you to Diane for jumping in because I asked her, I think, about five minutes before the picture. I said, hey, can you take our picture? Um, and she was very gracious in helping us to make that work. So thank you very much, Diane. And the picture's up. Yeah, the picture's already up and looks great. And thank you all for like, not making bunny ears in the picture, too. And thanks for the random Yes, <laughs> Anna. Yes, yeah, thanks to Anna, who we'll never see again. Um, I also, they're not here. It's so sad. I wanted to thank Patrick uh, McAvoy and Andrew Fingler, who've been managing all our live streams and fighting the good fight with that uh, so that everyone else who's not here physically could see what's going on. Okay, yeah, come on. Uh, so when you see them tomorrow, make sure and say thank you the next time you see them. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to thank uh, the folks who helped organize this. I've been working on this for several months. Um, so, uh, Anne. And Deb, is Deb in the room? She's, well, you, could, you should still clap for Deb. And Lauren, who's not able, she wasn't able to make the trip. And then Ed. Uh, and then I guess the last thing is please fill out the survey. 
Um, and I, at the request, I made a giant QR code. If you can't, that, that should be big enough for your phone, even in the back. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, please do enjoy BSC CAN. Uh, and we'll hopefully see some of you folks in Portugal in September. Um, the brave folks going to Kishner, well, you'll, I mean, you're going to see each other in the next few days anyway. Uh, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing some folks in some capacity in the fall. We'll, we'll let you know when we have more details about that. But I think that's it. Oh. Thank you. Too. <laughs> Oh, and uh, don't forget, uh, the, I guess, that the father and son, where we're at, where BSD Canada is a registration tonight, if you want to pick up your stuff. Um, and Michael would very much appreciate it if folks would go to the newcomer's boff at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, that's it. That? I don't remember. 1160, right? right here, then. That would be 1120. I think if you just walk around and you look at the different, you know, lecture halls on the ground floor and look for the people who are obvious BSD Can people, then because we stand out. Uh, you'll find us. Yeah, you look for, well, yes. <laughs> all right, cool. So I think we're all good. Thank you, Christoph. So 1120, that's where you can go help Michael out and the new folks. All right, I think we're done. Yay.
I'm not going to touch it there. Hey, water. So I tend to be like downstairs in the lounge. So Dan has paid for it to be open every night. But we don't see how that works to the So my plan is to try to just meet up there and then I'm going to open. Like you don't have to close the line, but it's just the last one. Oh, you're uh, special. Give me that. 
Okay. You will ask, so we have a dinner at six tonight? Yeah. 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 Yeah.